strategic partnerships and development here at Murr Ranch Group. Um, every, every other week, for those of you who are first joining, we discuss the ranch and sporting property market, buying and selling advice, the latest best stewardship practices, as well as topics currently impacting landowners. Murr Ranch Group is a full-service ranch real estate brokerage and consulting company focusing on legacy ranches and sporting and conservation properties around the West. Today, the enormous snowpack that Grow, uh, has grown this past winter across the West has been a welcome site for a region experiencing drought for a couple of the most recent years. But one thing we're starting to see is how this snowpack is impacting different types of big game and their habitats. Today, we'll talk about what's going on with these herd and, and what's being done and the impact on hunting this year, along with some other impacts and what we can do to help this. Uh, thank you to everyone who has submitted questions. We'll try to get to them on this broadcast. Please feel free to ask your questions in the comments and we'll try to get to them as many as we can. If not, we will reach out to you directly. Uh, helping me out today is the founder of Ken of Murr Ranch Group and himself, uh, Ken Murr. Welcome, Ken. Hi, Haley. I, I, I was just with my parents who were the founders of Ken Murr. <laughs> I know. I was like, how do I spin that? <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, thanks again for joining us. I'm glad yep. you found the time to get back from uh, Florida because we're. I'm excited to have this conversation. Yep. It'll be good. Um, no, I think we, we, we saw in these articles recently about, and we've written you know, recently in some of our, our blogs and, and uh, in our bulletin, you know, about some die off substantial uh, and hurt impacts by this, you know, amount of snowfall. And it got to me thinking, well, you know, how, how do we address this? And what do we talk about? And mm -hmm. bing, my light came on. I thought, well, we got to talk to Rick Danver, who uh, I worked with uh, at Western Western Landowners Alliance for, for many years. We would sit in the back of tour buses, touring around ranches, bouncing up and down and, 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 he would fill my ear with all kinds of things and help me understand all about it. And, and we chuckle, uh, we, uh, we, we share a sense of humor, but he really knows quite a bit and has been a wildlife manager for many years and, uh, and, and wildlife biology background. And uh, I've just learned a, a great deal. And I think our, our, our listeners would, you know, this is somebody that you need to listen to. So. Amazing. Well, without further ado, then, uh, please welcome to the Land Bulletin, Rick. <laughs> nice to have you, Rick Danver. <laughs> Thanks. Nice to be here. Now, we're, we're grateful you're here. As much as Ken and I can talk about a lot of different things when it comes to land stewardship, you are far and beyond more knowledgeable on the wildlife component. So we're excited to have you on the show. Well, it's I, I had quite a few years to learn things the hard way. Amazing. Managing, managing ranches myself. Well, I guess that leads to a great way to start the conversation is, Rick, how did how did you kind of get to where you are today? Uh, and what was your background with wildlife and managing it? Well, I started out as a, I, you know, got a degree in wildlife, worked for three different fishing game agencies, uh, New York, Colorado, and, and Utah. But after graduating um, from uh, Logan, in Logan, Utah, I got a job working for a, a ranch that was owned by a, a Chinese real estate investor, Joe Hotung, called Deseret Land and Livestock in uh, northern Utah, just north of the of, of uh, Evanston, Wyoming. It's about a two hundred thousand acre private privately owned ranch, and uh, and I I ended, stayed with that place for well, really third, about thirty five years. Um, it, it, it was eventually bought by the LDS church and they bought a bunch of other ranches. So I had an opportunity to manage all over the country on, uh, in different ranches. Amazing. And how did you and Ken meet? I think Ken, we met at WLA, but yeah. that, yeah. do you remember it? It was Western landowners. And, and like I said, we'd sit in the back and we just found, yeah, you know, our, 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 our zany humor, uh, would hit it off, but we, we learned so much in the process. Cause I, you know, I, part of it was why I joined WLA was just, I, there was a group here that speaks on behalf of, you know, private landowners. And then I learned what you did. And I remember being an up, I think we were up on Deseret at one point and just telling me the stories of how you would balance habitat for, you know, ranging from elk and, and, and mule deer and, sh but then you would have sheep grazing and cattle grazing and you understood what they would leave and left, leave behind and, and how all this was working. And I was just amazed. And, 
and we saw all those overpasses and underpasses in Wyoming and places, you know, for wildlife. And, you, you know, you, you, you've certainly taught me a lot uh, just listening. I, I didn't grow up about, you know, I, I think we also shared that we were both like from coal mining or steel, steel districts oh, where, yeah. you know, animals were plentiful. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're glad we, you both moved out west and that you met each other. But um, I just wanted to kind of get started on the topic at hand. Um, you know, as a skier and as a Coloradan, you know, the snowpack and runoff has always been super important uh, to our state. And in a lot of cases, having a ton of snow is a great thing. But this year we saw so much to such an extent that it's having another type of effect that we haven't seen in a while. And I kind of just wanted to go over that with the listeners if they haven't seen the news, but there's been a big die off of big game in the West, specifically Colorado and Wyoming is what we're going to be looking at. Um, but Rick, if you wouldn't mind kind of just talking to the listeners about what we're seeing and what's happening to these herds acro across the West. Yeah. Yeah. There's, and as you said, I think portions of Northwest Colorado, a lot of Western Wyoming and probably parts of North, at least Northern Utah. Well, I guess Southern Utah too are just getting exceptional snow. And what really, what's hard on big game is, you know, long periods of deep snow, particularly if it's crusted. Um, and as you might expect, it's, it's hardest on the littlest ones. Mm -hmm. you know, so it's harder on pronghorn than, and mule deer than it is on elk and moose. Elk and moose, moose can handle, handle it a lot better, get around in that snow. Um, and it's harder on the young animals than it is on the, the adults. Um, you know, pronghorn in particular really don't handle that snow well at all. Mm -hmm. uh, they die. They'll lay down and die. They have, they, they don't carry any fat into the winter um, like most of the other animals do. The theory is with pronghorn is that they they co-evolved. They're really a fairly ancient animal. They co-evolved with a, an American cheetah, you know, so they had to learn to run really fast. That's why they're so quick. Wow. And I suppose if you if you started packing on fat to make it through the winter, you ended up at the back of the back of the herd and the, and the cheetah got you. So they, <laughs> they're not, uh, they don't use that strategy. So I think what they always did was they moved away from it, you know, and, and 200 years ago without fences and, and bison out there and to follow around, they probably kind of followed those herds and they had, they had some of these bigger animals breaking things up for them. Um, and were able to, to try to move away from deep snow. Mm -hmm. Um, so you can't, they really, you can't feed them. They won't stick, they won't stick around on a feed ground. Um, you know, and feeding, feeding's a mixed bag anyway. You know, feed, you know, you can feed mule deer and elk and keep them alive if you start early and early enough, but uh, it's a great place to spread disease. And a lot of these areas that we're talking about, these, these animals, the deer in particular have uh, chronic wasting disease. And so you might feed them through the winter, but you might spread the disease worse. Mm. So the you know the it's a difficult situation. I mean, to some degree, um, you know, deep snow is going to kill animals. It's going to take. It's going to kill the young ones. But you know, there there are some things that we can do. You know, like mm. I mentioned, you could you could kind of mimic what the what the bison used to do um, by by using livestock or snow cats, things like that, to break some of that deep crusted snow and expose it to some of the deer and the pronghorn where they're at. And there still are quite a few states that will, at least in emergency situations, um, maybe feed elk in a location where you want them to be so they're not down on top of some of these poor landowners that are trying to winter their cattle mm -hmm. or they're not down on the highway getting, you know, causing accidents. So, you know, I, I guess the big, the big issue I see in, in a lot of these areas where we're, that we're looking at is you've got big game animals that have spent the winter um, not being able to access the limited winter range that we, they still have. And they're, they're standing on the roads. They're getting run over by trains and, and cars, and they're, and they're slowly starving to death. That's what we've seen, even like you were saying, even northwest Colorado, we do a lot of work up you know, steamboat to Craig over to the Utah border there. And you just see animals on the side of the road. It's, mm -hmm. it's, it's crazy. Um, and you know, they're just looking somewhere without snow on it. 
and they end up on the highways. And and uh, and I, I was thinking about when you were talking about feeding. I remember the days you go up to Jackson Hole, and they would feed those you know, those lands, the kind of just north of town there. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they, they feed the elk and all that. And I guess they I, I, they had some success in those situations. Or is that you know you yeah, in, in to some extent you can. I mean, you can. You know what that was set up for, and Wyoming's got quite a number of other feed grounds where they feed elk to to keep them up out of the irrigated lands that, that where you know where the livestock producers are trying to feed their cattle. Right. But the downside that they've run into with it, particularly on the feed ground you're talking about, that national wildlife refuge, is the spread of brucellosis. Uh, the elk have the elk have a have brucellosis, which most likely way in the past came from, from livestock, but the elk are carriers now. Um, it's hard on the elk, and now the elk can spread it back to, to domestic livestock. So, you know, that that's sort of the downside of feed grounds is it's a great place to, most likely one of the areas that, that spreads spreads the disease. It seems that, that elk in, on feed grounds have a higher incidence of the disease than, than those that winter scattered out in smaller groups. Yeah, it makes sense. So yeah, it comes down to better planning of how you do this because the feed grounds sounds like the last alternative you'd like to to resort to if you can. Yeah, it kind of cre- you know it kind of fixes one problem, right? The the elk on the in the in people's hay, but it creates another one. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a tough deal. And have you seen in your time out west? Have you seen this amount of die off? Is you know what do you project for twenty twenty three? Is is it similar to things you've seen in the past or is this a totally different? I've seen about three of these. The first okay. one I, I dealt with was 1983. Um, and where I was uh, at Deseret Livestock, we lost, we figured we lost about half the deer. Wow. And I, I remember in 1992, we had a similar situation. We had a dry summer followed by a bad winter. And what surprised me was following that winter, we didn't, we didn't see a single yearling, we, as far as we could tell, none of the none of the fawns survived the winter. We didn't see any yearlings the following year. So what I could I think we're going to see in parts of Northwest Colorado is uh, real heavy fawn losses and probably some calf losses. Probably going to lose some of the adult deer older than six. Mm. Their teeth are just by the time they get to be you know beyond about six years old, their teeth are just worn flat. They can't really grind up brush very well to make it through the winter it's kind of a physical thing Uh, probably lose some of the older elk those are 15 or older and uh, you know i think that it's probably probably wise for for landowners outfitters and and in the agencies to to let hunters know what to expect the thing that i learned when those with those hard winters is we would go out and, and, and count Mm-hmm. We figured we lost half the deer, but when you and actually went out there and drove around and looked at it, it looked like you lost ninety percent of the deer. It just was, you know, it looked pretty empty, you know, mm-hmm. compared to what it what it had the year before. You and know, if we were to not have a bad winter again, how how long does it take for that to like jump back to normal population standards after a, a winter like this? If you've got you know if if, if you've got healthy animals and, and decent range. And the weather cooperates. You should be able to come back in about three to four years. Got it for deer. And where do you project this kind of being the worst? Um, kind of the areas we've been talking about: northern Colorado, southern Wyoming. Yeah, I think most of and a lot, probably a lot of western Wyoming, and and northwest Colorado. Which one thing that's that's kind of tough is that the area in northwest Colorado. It's probably the hardest hit is the same area where the, the Colorado Divisional or Parks and Wildlife is uh, has to do a has to begin releasing wolves this, by December 31st, 23rd of this year. Mm-hmm. So that may be a consideration with the wolf reintroduction. I mean, I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but we it's it's kind of unfortunate that, that we're, we're starting to do the reintroduction right when the populations are down. So it might be worth going slow on that for the next five years. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think about that too. You you said there were probably three instances in the last several years, and um, and you can't. I guess you can't predict it. 
So you're always just trying to trying to manage private lands and hopefully public lands appropriately. But, you know, you throw on some of the drought and some of the other conditions, I imagine it gets perhaps this one could be even more severe. It could, may, they might not jump back as quickly. I, did, I assume drought and those type of things also have a, a major impact on, on, on the habitat. Yeah, you're right, Ken. Uh, you know, drought is, is a real big deal. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, in terms of fawn production and antler quality, for example, you know, drought can have as much or, or, or a worse effect than, than a hard winters. One of the things that I noticed, you know, I mean, I was in the business of trying to grow trophy animals for hunters. Uh, one thing we we saw was a following one of these these tough winters or a particularly dry summer. I mean, the animals are in poor condition going into the winter. That means they're in poor condition come April when it's time to start growing antlers. Um, and what we found was that, you know, antlers are probably five to 10 percent smaller than normal. So maybe places that might a, a bull that might have been a 350 bull is only going to be 325, 330. You know, a place that, that routinely sees buck deer that score, you know, 180, 190, they're going to be more like 150, 160. And it's a lot of the hunters are going to come in and they're going to swear that there aren't any mature animals. There are. They're just, they just had to use what nutrition they had in the spring to rebuild their bodies. And antlers are kind of jewelry. You know? mm-hmm. You're right. And the same thing happens with the fawn production. I mean, if those, you know, those, those deer, if the does just don't have enough nutrition to keep themselves alive through the winter and in the spring, they'll either, they can reabsorb fawns. They might drop fawns that are just so small that they don't survive. Yeah. Um, what people really don't realize in some of this listening, if you're not totally into this un- and understanding, but you know, we, when we, we talk to a lot of people who, who may be looking for uh, trophy animals and big game and how to manage that way or they may look more for higher density of animals uh, Mm -hmm. depending on what you want and it's a different management prescription i'm assuming and how you do this and and uh you know there's an art and there's certainly a science to this yeah and part of part of it is 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 just managing people's expectations isn't it right Mm -hmm. you know Yeah. And that's kind of why we're doing this today, because, you know, we started reading the news and we had a couple questions from buyers and those kinds of things about how this was affecting ranches and hunting and, you know, even values at some point. But like to your point, these things do bounce back. And when we were talking before this, Rick, there are a couple positives um, to some of this die off when it comes to recovery of habitat and kind of landscapes that these animals rely on. That's true. You know, and just to finish up on the, on the, the, the winter stuff too. And and this is sort of a management action, Mm -hmm. you know, even though the snow is going and we're starting to see some green out there, the worst might not be over animals in poor condition when they switch, start eating a lot of green grass. Sometimes that's what finally, puts them down. Mm-hmm. They could tip over. And so it's really important that even though we've all been, you know, cooped up all winter, <laughs> we want to get, you know, wait a while before we go out and look for antlers or go traipsing around. Give these guys another month or so to, to try to get back on their feet. Mm-hmm. You know, and don't push them on when they're when on these. They're, they're pretty vulnerable right now. That's a good point. Well, One of the upsides, though, like I think we, I b- believe we talked about before, was the just the idea that the, you know, the habitat quality might rebound a little bit with all that moisture we got, mm-hmm. and the fact that there's a fewer mouths to feed on it. So maybe the habitat will get a little bit better and help <laughs> us support those animals down the line. Yeah, maybe erosion will get a little bit better. There's, you know, there's some positives that might come from this. Well, um, and that speaks to maybe how you manage in this situation with cattle. Because oftentimes you're managing cattle. Now, do you wait to push your cattle out there too? Mm-hmm. Feed them extra, a little longer uh, versus putting them out on the, you know, on some, of the, uh, on some of the ground that might be habitat for, you know, wildlife? Well, that's a, that's a good question. I, you know, I know the wildlife don't like us you know, humans being out there. Mm-hmm. Um, I've, I've noticed quite often, I have, I've seen less of that response 
you know, I mean, just a, a behavioral response okay. to, to moving away from livestock. But, you know, the best way, I mean, we didn't really talk too much about livestock grazing. It, it can get, that could almost be a talk in and of itself. But the, the biggest thing I learned, and I, were, I got to work with some really good uh, land managers, some good grazers. And what, what most of them came to, uh, you know, after their years of working with it in this part of the West, in the Rockies, is that the the way you got to graze is is it's a it's a it's a magic combination of grazing and rest. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to you want to you want to take the the forage off, but then you want to allow it to recover fully recover before you do it again. Mm -hmm. And you know, it's not that one's better than the other. It's like that's like saying which is better, breathing in or breathing out, right? You got to get them. You kind of got to do both to to make it work. And so, you know. If, if we're going to manage for healthy ranges, the most important thing we can do is to, you know, have reasonable stocking rates out there and, you know, gra graze a portion of the, of the Rockies every year, but let have, have a portion of it be resting and recovering. Sure. And, and the wildlife are going to tend to shift a lot to that recovered area. Well, that kind of just brings up another question. Um, you know, these winter grazing lands for these, these this big game. Um, you said it, you alluded to it a bit at the beginning of this conversation, but that, you know, we don't have as much as we once did, these limited winter grazing for these herds that we're discussing. Are there any other kind of effects impacting these winter grazing valleys that are so crucial to these migratory herds that come through the West? Yeah, that's a, that's a, Another That's the million dollar thing. question. Yeah. You know? And and I think you, you're, you're right. I think there are some other things. And I, I think we are kind of lopsided in particularly in the Rockies where you're talking about mountains and valleys, you know, mm -hmm. and that there's there's probably a lot more, you know, acres of summer range than there is of of, of good winter range. And I, I and I think we've got you got cities, you got roads, you know, highways that are that are covering it up. You have some good ground that also has to winter livestock through the summer. But I think what, you know, what I'm seeing a lot in, in the West is that most of these, most of these small landowners, the private landowners that own the Valley bottoms that are still in agriculture are willing to put up with, with some big game. Mm. If, if we can kind of help them out a little bit and, and the big game, absolutely rely on them. The, the rest of us need to keep these small landowners in business. And by the rest of us, I mean, everybody that, that like, that, that likes to look at hunt, you know, just, you know, makes you feel good that they're out there. We've got to, we've got to realize that some of these small landowners are really being impacted. They don't have a big profit margin to begin with. Mm -hmm. Um, they've got land that you you know better, much better than I, how much how valuable their land is, to to switch it to some other use, um, and that's one of the things I've always admired about your organization is how you try to keep these lands as intact, working ranches, as opposed to you know housing developments. So, I think one of the most important things we can do is, in addition to managing for healthy range, so that animals can can gain good weight during the summer and bring it with them to the winter range is, is have the winter range out there. Even if it's in a year like this, just as a place to, to kind of stand mm -hmm. and, and, and make it through the winter where you're not standing on a highway or living in the middle of steamboat. What well, you were saying too, uh, and for listeners too, you know, what's the difference between a winter habitat and critical winter habitat versus summer range? For, for wildlife? Yeah, for the most part, it's elevational. Right. You know, most of the wildlife are going up in elevation to the, you know, the foothills or up into the mountains um, for the summertime. And in some of those, and, and on average in, in, in the areas that we're talking about, those, the higher elevations are owned by the Forest Service, Public or lands, sometimes right. the Park Service. Some of the, some of the lower elevations where they might be using in the you know, fall through spring, you see a lot more private ground down there. Mm -hmm. Some of it's irrigated ground, some of it's private kind of foothills, you know, that, that ranchers rely on. 
And, uh, you know, the big game absolutely needed. You know, if, if you don't have year-round habitat, the chain's broken. I mean, it's it's important to manage for healthy summer range, you know, and mm-hmm. fatten them up. But they, there's got to be a place to be in the winter. So let's face it, then, the, you know, with the abundance of public land, um, the, you know, the irrigated bottoms in those valleys are ultimately homesteaded, owned by private landowners. And even, you know, what, what I learned even with you by my side when we were up in Cody, uh, but that we were studying the ungulate migration in and around Yellowstone. And they were looking at, you know, how, how important just the private lands around Yellowstone matter to the survival of all these wildlife species. And I, you could say the same thing to these valleys in Northwest Colorado or any parts of, of you know, Wyoming, you know, Montana, et cetera, the, the private lands are really providing that sustenance for, for the survival of these species. Yeah, you're right. I mean, well, and that Yellowstone's a great example. I, and I don't remember exactly, but of the, you know, the big yellow, the big uh, elk herds that come out of Yellowstone every winter into Idaho, Montana, and Wyoming. If I remember right, something like 30 to 50 percent of the wintering habitat that they use is privately owned. Right. You know, I mean, if if it if those and and that that stuff there's 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 a lot of people that would love to own that land for maybe for other reasons, um, and if if we don't have a place for them to winter, we can drive around Yellowstone and look at look at geysers, but you're not going to see very many elk. Yeah, mm-hmm. good point. You know, and like you say, with the migra- sometimes migrations are, and movements are just so easy to disrupt. I I think you and I talked about driving down Interstate 84 in Utah. I used to live in Evanston. I'd have to drive down to Ogden quite often for for business of one one sort or another. And you drive down there in the winter. The left-hand side of the road, as you're going down the south side of the road, faces north. It gets It's cold. It's got a lot of snow on it. And a lot of times there'd be animals standing there looking longingly across the highway at the, the sunny <laughs> side of the valley, mm-hmm. you know, where it's, it's warmer, it's sunny. There's not near as much snow. There's bare spots, a little bit of green showing. But to get over there, to, to move the 500 yards they've got to travel, to get over there, they got to cross like... Oh, I don't know. I think six six fences, two frontage roads, a four lane highway with a cement divider down the middle, and a railroad. Two railroad tracks. Easy. Some of them can't do it. You know? yeah. I was thinking about the, the Great Escape uh, movie um, back in the day. Um, the guy was trying to escape from like a camp, Nazi camp, and he had to go over all those barbed wire. Steve McQueen. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine you're, you're an elk and having, you know, or antelope having to experience that? Yeah. Yeah. And bring your baby with you. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, do it every year. So with that, I mean, it sounds like managing some of these winter grazing valleys. I mean, a lot of what we could be doing, some of it is within our control as, you know, humans, while some of it is winter impact and, some of that is out of control. It's mother nature just kind of showing up. What are the other kind of things we can be doing to manage these winter grazing valleys for these well, populations? No, it's a great question. You know, and, and, and like, as Ken mentioned, you know, grazing management is, is going to be key. Mm-hmm. And I don't mean, I, I think it would be a mistake to remove livestock, you know, off the range. The, the mm-hmm. trick is to is to manage them with the with the understanding that there there are other mouths to feed out there. There's other herds out there, um, and you know the, the 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 best way to improve deer and elk winter survival is to put fat on them on their backs in the summertime, and come down to the winter ranges. You know, so good good quality summer range for both of them is is going to have be a, a nice mix of flowering plant, plants, shrubs, grasses. Uh, things like aspen and willows, you know, that's that's where they get that's where they fatten up and spend the summer. Mm-hmm. Um, you know that even if you have a bad winter, then you got deep crusted snow. If they've got, you know, two or three inches of fat on their back, they can kind of ride it out, ride out the bad periods, and and uh, you know not lose so much condition, stay healthy through the winter. 
And those are going to be especially, like you said, in the upper ground, some, some places which might be subject to summer grazing allotments and summer grazing permits, which we all believe the feds are still managing for, of course, wildlife on top of understanding a manage for, you know, the livestock as well. Um, and, and I, you know, I, I've, I've been seeing, you know, different ways. I think they're becoming more open to different grazing techniques, even on public lands. I just haven't seen that change significant, but, um, the, yeah, it's seeing... pretty slow, isn't it? Yeah. But, uh, I mean, you're right. And even, you know, even just the old forest service rest rotation system where you've got three pastures and you graze two, mm -hmm. two of them through the summer and leave one out is, is an improvement over just scattering things everywhere, you know, and, and I don't want to pick just on the livestock people that the, the more we have recreation, we've got going, going on on these summer ranges there's a lot of those summer ranges that are that may be suitable habitat that aren't going to be used by some animals because they just aren't going to tolerate the the four-wheelers the bikes the the dogs the you know mm -hmm. the people that are going to be up there i mean we you know we love the mountains too but we've got always got to you know be thinking about what effect we might be having on some of these some impacting some of these animals too yeah, I'm not the scientist, but I read that. I mean, you know, I, I, in fact, I think the, you know, the ranchers are probably caring more because you don't have, the feds just don't can't can't finance and don't have the budget necessary to manage these properties. So it's left to the shoulders of, of livestock industry. Who actually, if you follow some of the hoof and mouth and how they, you know, how that, I mean, how they, um, you know, the idea of holistic range management and applying those same techniques on on the public lands mm -hmm. should work. Right. The same same philosophy should work. But I, I do think we're loving it to death from a recreational standpoint. Yeah. Re recreation can be I, you know, I, I think it's having way more of a uh, it's it's going to be a big challenge going into the future. I think, li you know, we know how to how to how to graze livestock and, and wildlife together where, where there's the will to do that, mm -hmm. you know, and, and like I say, it, it, it involves, you know, I mean, if, if I were the king, we don't want to be grazing, you know, mm -hmm. 50, 60 percent of the of the West in any given year. And we'd be laying laying the other part out. But I'm not. <laughs> it's <stubborn>. smart. <laughs> <laughs> Are you Duke? Duke Rick. How's that? <laughs> Duke <laughs> Rick. So, Jester. I mean, so Rick, Jester Rick. Um <laughs> Uh, if it's not, you know, this just kind of to, in your opinion, if it's who's, whose role is it to kind of manage this and fix it? You know, I know landowners can, I know we're talking about how the feds sometimes don't have the funds or the capacity to do so, which type of organizations can help with this management? Is it a combined force of all of them or, you know, I, I think we've both, we've all probably learned the, the politicians and agencies finally kind of kind of do what the people want. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't they're they're considered leaders, but they they kind of react to what we want. And I think gr groups like Western Landowners Alliance, in all the years that I've been working, I haven't seen any any group make as much progress as that particular group. Which, and to Ken's credit, he served on the board and was one of the ones that helped helped get it going because they. They, like other groups um, before them, uh, decided that they were going to try to take a, you know, take a real broad look at things mm -hmm. and, and, and look for the compromise, look for the middle, look to collaborate with, with other, other interest groups out there and try to, try to manage our landscape for the, you know, for the long view um, and, and for what everybody wants. And part of that is keeping these land, these small you know valley landowners in the livestock business mm -hmm. so that they you know the, the big game still have some place to winter because that land with the, the what that land's worth it's not gonna you're not the fishing game's not gonna buy it and turn it into a winter range right it's never gonna happen it's gonna remain in private ownership question is is whether it's gonna grow habitat or, or houses well there's that relationship too between the private and the public lands it, uh, it, if, if uh, the, the ranchers are kicked off their lands, ergo the public lands, 
Um, and if you grazing free 93 and all those things that I used to hear about, you kick the ranchers off the public lands, they're going to sell their lands and, and all of it's going to get degraded in my mind. Mm -hmm. If you don't find, you know, this is what the things we appreciate too, when you drive down the valleys and you look at, see how many elk or deer, or any big game, eagles nesting in rivers corridors along ranches i mean you just see the diversity of the wildlife and alone because of the care and we did a thing on ecology of ranching re, re, uh, recently and talked about it and i think that's really we got to keep these you got you, there is a need for this livestock industry to survive not just economically but just you know from a land uh, use standpoint mm -hmm. yeah you're absolutely right they go you know the, they, they, there has to be that partnership, you know, mm -hmm. to, to, to keep, to keep all the whole, keep the whole thing. I mean, the wildlife don't know who owns what, you know, right. they don't care, mm -hmm. you know, but, but we've got to figure out how to put all of that stuff together. Yeah. You know? And, you know, and like you, when you mentioned all the, the wildlife you see on some of the private land, one of the things that really was a, an eye opener for me working at Deseret Livestock is we started a, a guy came to me who was a good birder and he wanted to start a bird watching program on the ranch. Now we didn't necessarily make a lot of money at it, but sometimes I just go out and ride around with him with the guests just to see, you know, what they were doing. And I remember one time jumping in with the van and there was a group of people from Pennsylvania that had come out. And I mean, I don't think they were particularly well off, but they were avid birders and they'd saved up their money, came out to Utah to bird. And I said, why did you, do it here. You could, why didn't you just go to the forest? They said, we learned a long time ago. If you want to see birds, you go to private ground. People but where they where they're managing the recreation, mm -hmm. managing the land. They said, we'll see, we'll see five times more birds, you know, as, as we do out on the forest. And again, that's sort of, a lot of that was what they were talking about was recreation pressure, mm -hmm. you know? So to, to many, ex I mean, sometimes, you know, a sportsman, you know, just get so mad at private landowners, they won't open up their place for recreation unlimited. But, you know, sometimes having a little bit of a refuge or at least a place, a quiet place where the animals could spend some time is mm -hmm. essential with their survival. We, I kind of felt that way when we were in Africa, Ken, how we went to these private reserves and that's where we saw mm. the majority of, that's you right. know, the animals that we saw because they're managing it and they're protecting it. Um, but I know there's a lot of, well, it may seem daunting and it's like, who's in charge, who's going to take, who's incentivized to make this happen and, you know, work together. Are there some programs out there that are working in your eyes, Rick, that, you know, have been successful or people out there who have had ideas to fix this problem? Yeah, and I think you guys are familiar with a couple of them. You know, the, the Colorado Ranching for Wildlife program. And then uh, after after that started, actually, I ended up on a, a group in Utah that we we were trying to figure out how to do something similar. And we finally just took Colorado's example and turned it into the Utah uh, CWMU program, Cooperative yeah. Wildlife Management Unit program. Great, great programs, right? Mm -hmm. They are, they are. Now, the, the, if there's anything that, that that probably could be better about those programs is that some of these real small guys in the bottom of the valley don't really have an opportunity to participate because they're either too small or they don't have big game on them during the hunting season. And I, my argument is is that those of you that are involved in those and ranching for wildlife and the CWMU program need to be reaching out to some of these downstream guys. If you really want to stay in the wildlife business, you know, you need to keep those guys in business because those animals have to have a place to winter. Mm -hmm. if, 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 and if the wintering ground goes, you're just going to have a big empty ranch, you know, and I guess I would, I would argue that sportsmen and the wildlife agencies also need to need to be, you know, working with to keep these things around. Another program that I see potential with, I don't know, I can't say that it's necessarily working all that great in Colorado is a habitat partnership program. I don't, I'm not real familiar with it. I've heard good and bad things about how it's being run, but I see it as an opportunity to provide, um, to help financially take care of some of these downstream guys. 
Yeah, there's a partners program, right? And 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 I'm actually, as part of, uh, I'm on the board of uh, the Colorado Cattlemen's Ag Land Trust, and we'll be kind of an intermediary holding and helping pass the, the cash out to the constituents who are doing the work mm -hmm. on the ground work. Nice. So there is this really cool partners program. I'm learning more about that, and I think they're they're trying to improve that. This, you know, so you can take ranchers who already, for instance, even already have a conservation easement on their ground and they're going to say, Hey, we'll give you some additional methods here and funding to help improve what we call somewhat additive conservation on your property mm. to make some enhancements. So that's, that's nice. You see in some of the, anything from reseeding, you know, fencing, you know, moving water, all those type of things are yeah. covered by those programs. Now that's, I think that's great. You know, one one that I'm kind of excited about, and this is one that I think Western Landowners Alliance had a lot to do with um, setting up is the, there's a new pilot program. It's called the USDA Big Game Pilot Program in Wyoming. Um, and I think a lot of it came from that that meeting, Ken, that we, we had over in Cody, mm -hmm. where you, you know, we, we realized that there were so many guys there that, you know, ranchers, large ranchers that were wintering all these, these elk and, you know, and, and these well elk and Cody, they're coming out of Yellowstone aren't just eating forage that the guys are trying to figure out how to raise their cows on, but these elk are carrying brucellosis, which can, you know, which can, you know, have a negative impact on their cows, serious financial impact. And they've got a herd of elk or herd of, a flock of pack of wolves following them down too, you know, mm -hmm. so it, kind of a big deal but this program is 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 going to be tried in wyoming on some of the in the migratory elk and deer areas um and it's funded through the uh, u.s department of agriculture administered through the um nrcs natural resource conservation service and the farm service agency and what it it's, it's to do is through a program called uh, grassland CRP, it puts money in their pockets for those, for some of these people that are, that are actively managing to keep these migration routes open, uh, to providing winter habitat for these, for these animals. And it's a step, to me, it's a step in the right direction. I mean, there's, there's an awful lot of money. Uh, I mean, if you're just looking for, for federal money, the, the Farm Bureau has quite a bit of money that can be used and I think should be used for some of these purposes. Well, the guys that own the grasslands are finally getting paid for that, you know, impact. We've, you know, they've been taking care of the cropland and impacts for a while, right? That's we're, right. We're, the states, have, particularly the states, have been taking care of cropland de depredation. And, and, and I understand why the state wildlife agencies have been, you know, they, they haven't been real keen on having to pay for big game wintering on the range ground because they don't have the funds. You know, and I think it, it, logically, if you're going if, if you're going to tap into some kind of governmental funds, it's about, about got to be the farm bill. And, and while we talk about funding, we we also got to realize, yes, there are wealthy landowners out there who might be able to bear some of the expense and things. But there are a lot of, uh, you know, ordinary ranchers who own these properties who, you know, already, you know, are, are just calling covering their subsistence by, you know, selling cows and raising cattle or sheep or other things. So yeah, it's, these programs are really beneficial for those folks. And, and, you know, Haley, we talk about this when we go out, we, we've taken a few of those car rides out to Pinedale mm -hmm. and just the migration corridors. And I've been watching, you know, not what started with Cody and doing that. And then you just learn these historic trails and corridors that they've been following for years. And all of this discussion we had today, because I was thinking we can do two discussions just on migration corridors yeah. and those type of things. But, you know, you said, well, it's really all part of the same issue. And it's, you know, we're, you know, down valley, up valley, you know, it, it, it has to do with winter range and all these other things. And, how, and this is why they move. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's, it's about keeping them in, in good health year round and keeping a habitat in good health year round. And, and as you say, some of these guys, you know, you take the, the, the guys down at the lower elevations that are kind of scratching on living with their cattle. They don't have a lot of money to put into modifying fences and, and uh, you know, trying to manage. 
I mean, it's they, most of them are, are doing some rotational grazing because they realize it's good for the land and, you know, good to produce forage. But, you know, I, I think the rest of us need to need to step up and, you know, it's not going to make a big impact in our wallets, but it's going to make a big impact in, you know, putting some money, having the, the governments and the non-governmental organizations, conservation organizations, put some money on the ground mm -hmm. and help these guys out. Well, now, and I read these migration corridors. Uh, some of these are well over a thousand years old. I mean, these corridors. Yeah, they probably are. You know, I, that's what I was stunned. I was like, whoa, this is, you know, there's something here. There's they some figured out a long here. time ago what worked, huh? They just keep building. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What was that, Ken? And not to bring up Africa again, but they had the elephant highway. Oh, yeah. You could yeah. see it for miles. It was. They, for years and years, have followed the same route, and we're just getting in the way. So why don't we help them out and get that get that migratory corridor back? We're um, building highways in the way. You know, think about I-80 and all that. So, um, you know, I, I, I just think people, you live in West, and hopefully you, know, you live on the Earth because you like the species and you like wildlife. So, you know, these are all kind of fun things to talk about. And, and uh and how landowners can do some changes and some modifications. And they're, like I said, there could be funding and hopefully the feds are doing that in conjunction, mm -hmm. you know, managing their, their properties as well. But, and there's so many different groups beyond like Western landowners that there's even regional groups that do these things locally, just ranchers getting together and just kind of cooperating together, like the Malpai borderlands group, yeah. and some of those things that are even private. Mm -hmm. You're getting to know the, the, the fish and game agency people they work with and the feds that they work with and, you know, building partnerships. And you, and you, you just mentioned the, the highways thing. I mean, that's a whole, that's an expensive proposition, but one that's going to have to be done in places mm -hmm. where we're just going to have to figure out how to, you know, we're going to have to spend some of our, our infrastructure money, you know, making it where, you know, bears and lions, deer and elk, you know, can, can get get on the other side of the railroads, get on the other side of the yeah. Interstate 80. And, uh, you but, know. but looking back at the years you've been engaged out here, I mean, you look back and say, hey, we're in, we're in a good place or, or you know, the, these struggles are impacting it. You know, the, how, how do you feel? How do you, I mean, what's your observation? I think in the, in the last five years, I've, I've, I've seen, I've become more, hopeful that we're actually going to deal with those issues, you mm -hmm. know, that, uh, you know, it, it, it was, a, it, it's been a struggle to get, to get legislators, I think, to start paying attention to it. But, you know, that's something that every, every individual can do is make noise. I mean, legislators listen to who makes the noise. Mm -hmm. And if, you know, if we're going to, you know, if, if we value wildlife, we need to, we need to put some money into it. And some of these, some of the overpasses and underpasses that Ken was talking about, they're, they're not cheap, mm -hmm. but they'll last forever. Oh, they're yeah. crucial. They are. Mm -hmm. No, I love that. And I love your message, whoever makes the most noise, because, uh, you know, programs like this, it's amazing to know that these things are happening and there's uh, people out there who care and are getting organized. But at the end of the day, it's, it definitely is the public. And even if you're not a landowner and you, love these spaces and you love to see this wildlife, you still do have an impact. So um, getting out there and, and doing something about it and listening to podcasts like this. And if people have questions, Rick, I know uh, we'll, we'll send them your way because you have a lot of valuable information, but sure. um, I think this was great. And I think it's important to, to educate those out there about what's going on and how we can help. So um, and hopefully, you know, they'll bounce back a little bit faster than they did in the last the last time you saw this. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. We'll hope so. Yeah. Awesome. Well, thanks, Ken and Rick, for joining us today. Um, I learned a lot, and I'm sure everyone watching did as well. So thanks so much. Yeah. Thanks, Rick. Thank you. See you guys next time. Awesome. And if you want to learn more about ranch real estate or ranch marketing process, please be sure to subscribe to our newsletter on our website at www.murranchgroup.com or give us a call at 303-623-4545. Thanks so much. See you next time.